Are you ready for the Word of God this morning? Please take your Bibles and please come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to go to a couple of other places before we come to that, but that's going to really be where we want to pitch our tent today. Beloved, we are at war. It is a spiritual warfare, and we are an army. We are Christ's army. We are soldiers of the cross. Title of the lesson today, Equipping the Army. I am so mindful of that this would have been our 20th Youth Bible Study Weekend. And our our topic, the, the theme, was this great, noble pursuit of warrior. Taking your stand in the full armor of God. We are an army, not an audience. An audience just sits there. An army prepares, and then an army goes out. We want to talk today about what it is to equip the army, and I'm so mindful, and and here what we've done is we've, we've, we've reached out to all of our guest speakers, and they're all on board to come next year, Uh, and even Friday at the time that we would have gotten together and we would have been preparing and praying together. Every one of them is committed next year. If the Lord Jesus delays in returning, and we have summer 2021, those lessons will be presented then. And I'm telling you, we need. This message is so important. And it'll be needed even more next year. Our goal this morning, our goal when we come together in joyful assembly is to lift up, it is to glorify, it is to make the most out of Jesus Christ. And we want to make disciples. As someone has said, we are a bunch of nobodies trying to tell everybody that there is a somebody who will save anybody. Youth Weekend. We're saving for 2021 this message needed. And the challenge this morning is to engage in this topic and yet not preach what had been planned and laid out. We tried to bring young people to Christ. We call it a youth Bible study weekend. And that's exactly what it is. You know, through the years... Uh, you know, some brothers, well-meaning, they don't get it. They've called it our youth rally. It's not a youth rally. We're not just trying to get young people together to go, rah, rah, we're young. And it isn't a youth forum. A forum would be sort of, a, you know, we put up a, a long table here with a bunch of chairs And we have a lot of young people speaking to young people about what it is to be young people. That isn't it. It's a Bible study weekend. And our target audience is young people. In the longest psalm of the Bible, in Psalm 119, The writer there asks this rhetorical question. He says, how shall the young secure their hearts? Beloved, it's through the word of God is the resounding answer. In this perspective of warfare, I want to set the stage. I I want to give a context. And I'm asking you, it is absolutely critical It is absolutely essential that you 
think this morning. In fact, it's absolutely critical that you think all the time. And I say that because we are in a culture right now that doesn't want to think. They want to react. They want to feel. And how, how dare you challenge or ask questions. We just want to go with what we want to go with. I'm asking you. It is absolutely essential as we set the stage this morning and we get a context for spiritual warfare that you are ready to think. Are you ready? So here we go. I want you to take a look at that. Do you recognize what that is? What is it? It's a Bible. And what has someone done to it? They have cut things out of the Bible. Now, this is not just an object lesson. That is actually a real Bible. It is actually in the Smithsonian Institution. It is a New Testament. Do you know to whom it belonged? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. It was his Bible. And what he did was he took the Gospels and he cut out of it with razor blades everything he didn't like. Everything that didn't fit into his worldview. So he cut out the things he didn't want to think about. You know what he cut out? Every single one of the miracles of Jesus. He cut out every single reference to the supernatural. He cut out everything that referred to Jesus as being divine. And the thing that just kills me is he ends it. With the verse from John chapter 9, and after they crucified him, they laid him in a new tomb where no man had been laid. Period. End. In fact, Jefferson labeled his New Testament Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we, we sit there and I, I see, literally, there are people with their jaws hanging open. You, I cannot believe that. The audacity of that. But I am telling you that what Jefferson did physically, we have a tendency to do practically or pragmatically. We cut out the things that we don't like. We cut out the parts where God does not act like we think he should act. We kind of dis dismiss, put aside, razor out of our brain and out of our heart the things where we say, well, <sighs> you know, God, I really don't know what you were thinking there. Beloved, this is where the battle really begins with our thoughts, with our heart. The battle of the universe is fought in the human heart and in the human mind. Author Tim Keller said, if God never disagrees with you, you may be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Theologian Karl Barth said, if God doesn't make us mad, we aren't worshiping him. We're worshiping ourselves. If our God never contradicts us and only likes what we like and hates what we hate, he's not the real God. All we have done is deified our preferences. Wow. 
So, as we prepare for battle, as we are ready to engage in battle, as prepared, equipped, thinking Christians, let me ask this question. How in the world do we fight for Jesus Christ in these crazy, non-thinking times? Culture. Culture is defined as the social behaviors and norms found in a society. We could spend an entire uh, <laughs> morning talking about the, uh, the dichotomy, the uh, polarization, the hypocrisy, the discrepancies that are alive in our culture right now. Let me hit on one that just isn't in the headlines today. With the rise of the Me Too movement, here's how inconsistent our culture is. With the rise of the Me Too movement at the exact same time, do you know what the number one best-selling book of all time among women is today? Fifty Shades of Grey. All right, enough said. Let's go to Scripture. Before we get to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we talk about equipping the army, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, our theme for what it is to be a spiritual warrior Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, brings to a conclusion this great epistle, and he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. We're going to be singing those words in a few moments. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Schema. It's the same word for schematic, for plan. The devil has a plan. He has a strategy. He's thought it out. Be prepared. You put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against his plans. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and then, having done everything to stand, stand. I want you to note what Paul articulates in terms of the identity of the enemy. Think, who are we fighting? Beloved, we are not fighting people. Oh, it feels that way. Oh, does it feel that way. But Paul makes it clear, that's not who we're fighting against. He says we are not fighting against flesh and blood. What are we fighting against? We are fighting against rulers. Well, aren't rulers people? We're fighting against authorities. Well, aren't the guys in authority, aren't they people? Paul's building an argument. He's building a case. He's asking you to think. Real rulers, real authorities. And then he says against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil that are at work in the heavenly realms. This is spiritual warfare, and our enemies are not people. Our enemies are ideas. It's worldviews. It's thoughts. It's perspectives. It's feelings. And it's even non-thinking. That's the enemy. So we have to think. And 
we are engaged in a culture that really doesn't want to think. And we're calling them to think and to be accountable because the gospel is nothing if it doesn't penetrate our mind on our way to our heart. Well, get your Bibles ready. Get your Bibles ready and come with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 2. There is a passion in what we are talking about. Anybody knows uh, that any of the great movies about great battles, there is always the moment when the general or the leader or the king comes out before the troops and he makes the great declaration of why we are here. And it is a passionate plea. But I'm telling you what, he better have some really good reasons as well as some passion behind what he's saying. There is a passion. There is a spirit-directed energy. There is the work of God engaging the lives of his people, meaningful direction, a sense of energy. That's what we're talking about today. We want to equip the army. We want to take God's word for its intended purpose. We want to think about it, and we want to be prepared, and we want to be equipped by it. So I want us to come to that last piece of literature Paul ever wrote, 2 Timothy, chapter 2. It's a brief letter. Four chapters. And it's anything but simple. And the thing that makes 2 Timothy come alive is its context from where it is written. This is dungeon. Paul isn't writing this as he is sitting comfortably uh, in an Italian villa and um, you know, on the Mediterranean somewhere sipping tea. Most of us have never seen a dungeon. Some of us have. Some of us, in fact, have seen this dungeon. But even though we've seen it, it was pretty well sterilized. And we certainly didn't live there. So allow me. John Pollock, in his work, The Man Who Shook the World. Paul was this time placed in rigorous confinement in Rome, not as an honorable citizen, but as a criminal, chained. He was among the fellows in the Mamertime, an obnoxious dungeon, reached only by rope or ladder, let down through a hole in the floor above. His weary body must lie upon rough stone. The air was foul, sanitation non-existent. The trial that would follow would be where he would stand shackled in chains, bearing the marks of age and torturings before a godless Caesar named Nero. James Stacker does a good job of describing the irony. He says, on the judgment seat, clad in imperial purple, sat Nero, a man stained with every crime, a man whose whole being was steeped in every nameable and unnameable vice, nothing but a compound of mud and blood, and in the prisoner's dock stood the best man the world contained. His hair whited with labors that served the good of men and the glory of God. Such was the occupant of the seat of justice. Such was the man who stood in the place of the criminal. And T.R. Glover, an English classicist from Cambridge, 
made this observation. I've shared it before. I absolutely love it. He said, the day was to come when men would call their dogs Nero and name their sons Paul. Paul, from that dungeon, he writes his closing words. This is dungeon talk. He is cold. He is lonely. He has come to the end and time for him to pass along to the younger man. Some insights and some guidelines for warfare. Some truth for the church. It is as if Paul, through his pen, is passing the baton as in a relay and saying, run with it. And Timothy, in turn, will pass it on to others. This is so relevant. This is so relevant for today, for the battle that we are engaged in today. Don't let anyone ever tell you that the Bible isn't relevant. Whoever says the Bible isn't relevant, they're not relevant. With that in mind, I want us to look at four timeless characteristics of wartime preparation. Four characteristics of a dynamic, equipped church. If you have a pen handy, I'm going to have you underscore four verbs. The first one is found in verse 1. Be strong. The second in verse 2. Entrust. The third is found in verse 3. Suffer hardship. And the fourth, come all the way down to verse 10. It's endure. Be strong. Entrust. Suffer hardship. Endure. Always pay attention to the verbs when you are reading Scripture. They are the structure of literature. Let's start with this first distinctive, be strong. It is always important to be strong in the Lord's work, but I want you to notice what Paul says to be strong in. He says, you therefore, my son, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. A church that is dynamic, a church that is reaching the lost, a church that is equipped for battle, is strong in grace. Strong in grace. And it is led by people who understand what it is to be strong in grace. Paul could write it, command it, because he modeled grace. And the message goes to all people, to the Gentiles, to the dogs, and he modeled grace. It is the strength, it is the backbone of the church. So this message of the cross, remember our Lord Jesus who though he was rich became poor for our sakes that we might have his riches. That's grace. In fact, John in his gospel, the very first chapter, said that through Moses came the law, but now through Jesus came grace and truth. The two pistons that move the gospel, grace and truth, truth and grace. It's so important that we speak the truth that we think critically, and that we say, this is right, that is wrong, this is truth, that is error. And at the exact same time, we do it with grace, compassion, for a lost and dying world. You know why? Because we once were lost and dying. 
Here's something to keep in mind as we are engaging with our culture. Understand that every single one of us who is now in Christ, we, every one of us, I don't care the color of your skin, you were a former slave. And we have been set free. And the truth of the matter is, every person that we come in contact with in this lost and dying world, they are a slave to sin. And we reach out and we say, I once was like you. You can be free. And we proclaim through Christ, liberty. John Newton put it best. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. Churches that are equipped with grace and truth are actually not only dynamic, they are quite attractive. Second distinctive in trust. Verse 2. Churches that are contagious faithfully mentor the young. Those who are coming along in the Christian life. I love that thought. I love that thought. We see people as opportunities to build into their lives. Now, where do we get that? Well, verse 2, in trust. Deposit as a trust. Deposit into these faithful men, what they will then deposit into others. Note, note how many generations are spoken of in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. There's Paul, and he gives it to Timothy, who will give it to faithful men and women, who will be able to give it to others also. It is this continuous chain. It is this continuous supply line of battle needs, like running a relay race and passing the baton, note, very quickly, very quickly, Paul would be out of the picture. Very quickly, Paul would not know who it was being passed on to. That's the way it works. One touches the life of another who touches another who touches another who touches another. And that is a dynamic, contagious, equipped ministry of multiplication. A church is not a gathering of people who sit and listen to one person preach. It's not just that. The lesson is just the start of the baton. This is where information, this is where encouragement, this is where challenges are communicated. Now, take the baton and build into your life God's bedrock of truth. And then build it into someone else's life this week. You touch them. You see, the truth is, everyone needs a Barnabas and everyone needs a Timothy. It was Barnabas who taught Paul. It was Barnabas who encouraged Paul. Barnabas handed to Paul. Paul handed to Timothy. We need someone before us to mentor us, and we need someone beyond us to whom we are mentoring. Otherwise, we are a stagnant lake. We are the Dead Sea, always receiving we sit, we take notes, we walk out, we come back next week, we sit, we take notes. What is wrong with that picture? There's no engagement. There's no connection. There's no contagion. The only reason the apostle made that deposit is so that there might be a change in the lives of those being mentored. I am the product of having been mentored. That is our goal as church. 
The church that is dynamic and equipped and contagious cares enough about people to build into their lives. Let's remember that. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And now the third distinctive is suffer hardship with me. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This third distinctive, when the body is tested, it pulls closer together. When one hurts, we all hurt. Verse 3 literally reads, the very first thing that appears is the word with. With suffer hardship me. With. We suffer with. And that is the secret to this kind of equipping. This is the secret to this kind of engagement and contagion. We are in it together. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. The world does not operate that way. For the world is like rats on a sinking ship, scattered in every direction. I want you to look at three metaphors that Paul uses. You've got your Bible open to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 4. After saying, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, verse 4, No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. A soldier has commitment. And then in verse 5, he says, Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Athlete. Discipline. And then, verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be first to receive a share of the crops. Farmer. Patience. Those three images, those three metaphors, soldier, commitment, athlete, discipline, farmer, patience, and dedication, a dynamic and equipped, a contagious church is made up of people who get the job done, like a soldier, like an athlete, like a farmer. Suffer with me as a soldier, as an athlete, as a farmer. We have hard work ahead of us. We have great work ahead of us. Let's pray like we've never prayed before. Let's get together. like we've never gotten together before. Let's be of one mind. Let's believe in one another. This is not a pep rally. This is biblical truth. And then fourth, endure. Verse 10, we endure all things for the sake of those chosen of God. Endure. This is one of Paul's favorite words. In fact, it's actually two words, hupo meno, and it literally means to bear up underneath. It's uh, the idea of a power lifter getting up underneath the bar And then with all of the body strength he has, he pushes up under the weight. We abide under. That's where we live. We don't quit. We don't stagnate. If we say that we are committed, we're committed. I'm so amazed by the number of brothers and sisters who, even after we announced that our youth weekend was 
cancel due to safety concerns related to the COVID virus. We made that announcement and still people came and gave the money that they said that they were going to give. Because they were committed. Because we are committed to enduring whatever for the benefit of others. And so we make room. We make room. We provide. For those who want to learn about Jesus, not only right here in southeastern Wisconsin, not only for young people that we have an opportunity to mentor when they come for our youth Bible study weekend, but for those literally all around the world. And if we do this, we couldn't build a building big enough. It's all about equipping the army. It's all about putting it in the right context where we think it through. Now, how do we sustain it? Well, remember these four distinctives. Remember what it is that Paul, in his last and final words, as he's passing the baton to us, what he's saying. Be strong and trust. Suffer hardship and endure. How do we sustain it? We remember the distinctives. And secondly, you got to watch out. We got to watch out for battle fatigue. And third, we have to reinforce basic training. We have to reinforce basic training. We have a generation coming up that I am so fearful, isn't learning how to think. They aren't valuing critical thinking. And that you have to work through a process of logic and reasoning in order to understand this world, in order to understand what's happening in this world, and how the gospel is the answer for the ills of our society. Men and women, we are in for the time of our lives. Fellow soldiers, <laughs> this is exciting. This is the most exciting adventure ever. Will you pray with me, please? How thrilling it is, Heavenly Father, to realize what you have begun and what you have begun will continue. How wonderful it is that what we are a part of is not built around just a few talented people. It is built on the one and only King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord, may we reaffirm our commitment to you and to our King Jesus. Help us to think. Help us to be filled with what the gospel promises to fill us with, grace and truth. Hear our prayer now, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. The gospel call is this. The one who is king of kings and lord of lords is also the great physician. It's amazing to think that he is the greatest ruler of all times and at the exact same time he is there and able and willing to heal the very ones who have been wounded by their own sins, who have literally fallen on their own swords. If you're not a Christian, we're asking you to think and make a decision. Joyfully sharing the good news this week of Maxie and all of the young people who have responded to the gospel and have made that decision for themselves. And someone lovingly said, Man, is there something in the water up there? 
Well, it's not in the water. It's by faith and obedience in the blood of Jesus Christ. It is access by water. And if your desire is to confess your faith in Christ today and to be buried with Christ in baptism today, we can. And you can become a soldier of Christ. Soldiers of Christ, arise.